Our scripture lesson this morning is found in the 23rd chapter of the book of Proverbs. Chapter 23, we will begin our reading with the first verse. May we give our attention to the Word of God. When thou sittest to eat with a ruler, consider diligently what is before thee, and put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meat. Labor not to be rich. Cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And may God speak to us today through this portion of his holy word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. It was his first solo flight. He thought he had done pretty well during the lessons, but now he was up there on his own, and all had been going just fine until he came to the place of landing. Now he found what was the designated runway. His teacher was on the radio on the ground instructing him, and he nosed the plane down rather sharply toward the runway. And then he heard a voice over the radio saying, correct your attitude. My attitude? What's wrong with my attitude? He says to himself, I think my attitude is just fine. More urgently comes the voice, correct your attitude. Why the nerve of that fellow? There's nothing wrong whatsoever with my crash. Two weeks later when he woke up in the hospital, his instructor was there and he had the flight manual opened and a definition underlined. Attitude, the plane's inclination toward the earth. Well, there's no doubt about it. His attitude almost destroyed him. And in a different sense of the word, our attitudes can completely destroy us. Attitude, you'll find, as I'll point out later, is ultimately our inclination, not toward the ground, but toward God. And it is most determinative in the success of your life. The popular radio preacher Charles Swindoll said this about it, attitude. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on my life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. And yet we spend most of our lives working on our appearance, our giftedness, and our skill, and very little time on our attitude. We cannot change our past, he says. We cannot change the way people act toward us, but we can change our attitude. The only thing we can do is play upon the string that we have, and that is our attitude. I am convinced, he says, that life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react to it. The Bible, I think, echoes that sentiment. It says, out of the heart are the issues of life. And as our text said this morning, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, the use of the text in the passage we read is dealing with a particular and a narrow situation, how you should conduct yourself if you are having dinner with an insincere ruler. Well, now, probably not too many of you are too concerned about how you're going to eat dinner the next time you're eating with a ruler. but. 
this principle which it asserts has a much wider application and even more important, as is often the way that principles are revealed to us in the scripture. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It has been said, you are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. You all got that, didn't you? Let's try that again. I'll put in the proper punctuation. You are not what you think you are, but what you think you are. A man's life consists of the multitude of his thoughts, said Marcus Aurelius in about 200. But 3,000 years ago, God said the same thing. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And thoughts that multiply and become habitual become attitudes, the attitudes with which we face life. And these attitudes are going to determine your success in life, more than education or skill or many other things, how you deal with your attitudes about them. Attitudes affect our relationship with others, our relationship even with ourself, and our relationship with God. I'm sure we all know people who have extremely negative attitudes about everything. You know something? We avoid them as much as we can. They're always down. Everything is always grim and glum. And we'd really rather turn and go the other way than have to listen to their complaints. Every discussion seems to be an organ recital. <clears throat> there are other people, however, who have very bright attitudes. They're optimistic, positive. They're always friendly and loving. I had a friend like that in college. It was always a joy whenever I saw Bobby. He just lifted my spirits every time I saw him. There was such a bright smile on his face and he was so warm. Wouldn't you like to have a friend like that? Wouldn't you like to be a friend like that? Well, you can be if you'll change your attitude. That's what is needed. You know, our attitudes are the interior decorators of our lives. They paint the walls and ceiling of our mind either with the somber hues of browns and blacks and prison gray, or maybe with bright blues and greens and pinks and rosy reds. Some people seem to be painted one way all the time. I can think of people right in this congregation, and it's just inevitable every time you see them. They got a fresh coat of brown paint. You can just see it. It sort of seeps through from their mind to their skin. It affects their countenance. It even changes the timber or timbre of their voice. It even can be seen in the sparkle in their eyes or the lack of it. It even has some weight because it turns down the corners of the mouth. It's a terrible thing. Not only does it affect our interior design, it can even redecorate your house. Here is a home. The mother and two children who have been home from school for a couple of hours are having a good time. They're talking and laughing and joking and then daddy comes home. Suddenly the temperature drops 40 degrees. He hasn't been in the house five seconds until he's repainted all of the walls black. He's hung crepe over the windows and it's going to be a long, long night. Another in a long list of long, unhappy evenings. Or maybe it's the other way around. The husband's been at work all day. He survived that. He's looking forward to coming home. He's delighted to see his family again, and he walks in, and voila, his wife has redecorated the house. Everything is a dark brown. 
And no sooner does he take a look at her than he sees that the paint has seeped through onto her face. It's a dark brown, too. And he knows it's going to be a long, hard evening. Those are our attitudes. And they will determine in large measure our success in life. It is no platitude that we must watch our attitudes. Attitudes are largely how we react to things that happen to us. We all have a natural reaction to things. We all know what that is. It is a natural reaction if somebody smacks you in the cheek to smack them back. But you know, if you want to find the Christian reaction, that's a supernatural reaction. And how do you figure out what it is? It's very simple. If you'll just wait about one second before reacting, and say to yourself, how would I naturally react to this? And then do the opposite. That's the Christian way. It's not the easy way, but it is the way of Christ. It's the way of him who said, Father, forgive them to those that were, had nailed him on the cross. And it's a transforming way because as the title of this message says, change your attitude and change your world. You can change your world by changing your attitude. You can transform your circumstances. I think of a young man in his late teens that I see almost every Sunday here at church when I come early. And uh, I always say to him, well, good morning. How you doing? And his answer is predictable. It's never been anything other than pretty good. <laughs> I look at this young man. He's young. He's healthy. He's a nice-looking fellow. And I wonder what circumstances there are in his life that makes him feel that he can't say anything more than pretty good. And I'm reminded of the man that came up to Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, my spiritual father. And uh, Barnhouse asked him how he was. And he said, oh, pretty good under the circumstances. And Barnhouse, who had all of the timidity of a charging bull and all of the tact of a Sherman tank, said to him, under the circumstances, why, man, whoever told you you're supposed to be under the circumstances? We are seated with Christ in the heavenlies, far above all earthly circumstances. Now, I'm sure that the man went dancing gleefully out of the room. Well, I doubt that he did that, but I'm sure that he never forgot his encounter with Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse, as I never forgot mine. And I'm sure also that he thought about those words, because, my friends, that's exactly the way it is. We as Christians don't need to be under the circumstances. I was thinking early this morning about this past week, six work days, and I thought they were an interesting week. I had six, I had three days when I felt great. In fact, uh, last yesterday was one of them, and last night someone asked me, well, how are you doing? And I said, fantastic. If I were any better, I'd have to hire somebody to enjoy it with me. But the other three days, I was in excruciating pain all day and night. Those are the days, are they not? We all have them one way or another. Those difficult, trying, awful, painful days of some sort or another. How do you respond then when people say, how are you doing? Well, you know, I, I don't like to be dishonest. So I wrestled with that for a long time. I finally figured out the proper answer. 
And I said to someone the other day who asked me that, he said, how are you doing? And I said, I'm rejoicing in the Lord. And that's the biblical answer. That's what Paul said. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. That's what Christians should be doing, rejoicing. You say, oh, those are just pious platitudes. Oh, are they really? Well, look at the man that said that. Look at him sitting in the interior cell of a jail in Philippi. His back is a bloody mess from the lash. His hands and feet are shackled in stocks. The door is locked and bolted. It's midnight. He's in great pain. He's lost all of his civil rights. His future is bleak. He's got nothing at all to be happy about, it would seem, to any observer. And so what does he do? Well, he and his partner sing a song of praise. I say, well, that is a pretty dumb thing to do, a situation like that. He should have been complaining and lamenting. But that attitude transformed his circumstances. You remember after the doors were thrown open, the jailer came in and let them go and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? He wanted whatever it was that this man had who could sing in a cell at midnight. His attitude transformed his circumstances. Change your attitude, and you can change your world. Not only do our attitudes affect us in our relationships with others, but also with ourselves. Our attitudes can destroy our own bodies, can destroy our own minds. Back in the 30s, Dr. Alfred Adler, who had been a student of Freud, broke with his master and disagreed with his idea that sex drive was the only drive that compelled and drove people, and said that he believed that the most significant drive was the drive for recognition and appreciation. And many people resonated to that. And he said that when people don't get that recognition and acceptance and appreciation, that they began to feel that there's something wrong with themselves. And he came out with a new term. It was called an inferiority complex. And boy, Americans in the 30s, they just said, that's exactly what it must be. That's my problem. I've got an inferiority complex. And so that became, he became famous overnight, as did that term. In fact, I remember when I was a young man, I thought maybe I had an inferiority complex. Any of you ever think that? Well, I was going to find out, so I went to a psychiatrist. And I told him I thought I had an inferiority complex. He checked me over very carefully. He said, nope, happy to say you, you don't have any inferiority complex. He said, you're just inferior. <laughs> Made me feel much better. <clears throat> Took care of that matter all at once. <clears throat> That's a joke, folks. <laughs> I'm not concerned about your thinking me inferior. I am concerned about your thinking I've been to a psychiatrist. <laughs> Don't want that to get around. <clears throat> they do have to deal with, <laughs> I think about one lady who came to a psychiatrist and she said, doctor, I have a terrible problem. He said, well, tell me about it. What's wrong with you? Oh, she said, it's not me, it's my husband. He thinks he's an elevator. Oh, well, that, that is a problem. Uh, well, just, where is he? Tell him to come in. I'll talk to him. Oh, well, he's an express, and he doesn't stop at this floor. <laughs> Who really had the problem? <laughs> but not only inferior feelings like that destroy many lives, but, you know, when you come to know Christ, things are changed. 
And I, like everyone, of course, have had such feelings as that in my life. But you know, I remember seeing a sign. I've seen it many times since. And it ought to be put up in every home or nailed on the walls of your mind. Ooh, that hurts. Uh, put it up with some kind of glue. I think that'd be better. And what it says is, God don't make no junk. I prefer to translate that, God doesn't make any junk. I don't think God would be ungrammatical, do you? But you know, there's a great truth there, and I begin to realize that. God doesn't make junk. You and I are special. We are unique. There's never been anybody in the world like you, and there never will be again. You are a very special person. God made you like that. And you can fill a special niche in this world. You don't have to compete with everybody else. All you got to do is love them and be what you are. And God will take you and bless you and use you. But not only inferior feelings, but the, there are also other things that attitudes can do that destroy our own happiness and our own effectiveness in life. You know what the big three attitudes are? The big three that put most people in mental institutions, that cause breakdowns, that cause depressions, that cause despair, here they are. The attitude or feeling of guilt. Guilt puts more people in mental institutions than everything else combined. Two, the attitude or feeling of fear or anxiety. The Bible talks about men's hearts failing them for fear in a certain time. We must be living in that time as certainly many hearts are failing with fear. How many millions of Americans are filled with anxiety and fear about what the future? They're getting older. They're getting balder. They're getting sicker. Their job may be on the line. All sorts of ominous things are out on the horizon. And so their hearts are filled with anxiety, with worry, with fear. Well, what did Jesus say over and over and over again when he met the disciples? Fear not. Be not afraid. Fear not. It is I. The third one is anger or hatred. How many people hold hostility and bitterness toward others? Is there someone right now that you hold hostile feelings toward? I remember a lady in our church told me once that her mother had a settled principle that she never forgave anybody that hurt her. It was just a principle. She didn't do it. And I thought to myself then, and I do now, oh, that poor woman, what she did to herself. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if somebody came and hit you and you said, I'm going to fix that person. And so you get a, get a hammer and you beat yourself on the head with a couple of hammers on the toe and hit your thumb. Keep hitting yourself with a hammer. That wouldn't be very smart, would it? That's what we do to ourselves when we hold animosities and angers and hostilities and hatred toward other people. They eat us alive. They not only destroy the mind, they destroy the body as well. We know that there are psychosomatic illnesses, and they are principally caused by guilt and fear and anger. Some people are angry against God. Well, what's happened? God did that to me, and I'm never going to believe in Him anymore. Ah, my friends, what is the answer to all of that? Let me point out to you, I said in the beginning that attitudes were our inclination toward or away from God. Let me tell you something I hope you'll never forget. All of these negative attitudes of fear and shame, of guilt, of anger, hostility, all of these are produced by one thing, unbelief. That's what unbelief produces in a heart. And the antidote to it is belief. It is faith in God's Word. Look to the cross. Do you have guilt? Listen to him there upon that cross saying, 
Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Do you have difficulty forgiving others? Look to him who forgave those that nailed him to the cross. Are you filled with anxiety or fear about the future, what it holds? Listen to him from the cross. Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. When Christ solves the greatest problem that man faces, which is death, he can solve all of the lesser ones as well. Do you have anger in your life? Are you angry at someone? Are you angry at God? Jesus Christ endured the worst punishment the world has ever seen. The wrath of God fell upon him and his last words, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Look to Christ and his word. The Bible talks about the washing with water by the word. The word of God, faith in that word, faith in his promises, faith that he is going to turn all things together for our good, faith that he has prepared a place for us in heaven, faith that he's going to provide all of our needs out of his riches and glory, faith in his word will dispel all of those negative attitudes and thoughts in the minds of men. That's why it's so important and I urge you to spend time every day in his word and not just a minute or two, but spend time, read his word, meditate upon his word, hide his word in your heart. Why I encourage you to learn it at night because if you don't, those negative attitudes will build up in your life as a result of unbelief in his word and his promises and you can't believe them if you don't know them. Ah, dear friend, our thoughts and attitudes can even affect our relationship to God. The Bible says, let the wicked forsake his way and let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Repentance involves turning from our thoughts. The Bible says that Christ says to us that if we are angry with someone, we are murderers. If we have lusted against someone, we are adulterers. That the thought is the same as the deed. And we, the unrighteous man, is to turn from his thoughts and pray that God will cleanse not only our hands and feet, but our thoughts as well, and that we might lift our thoughts unto the Lord. Would you be cleansed from your sins? May I say that wicked thoughts would disbar you from entrance into heaven? One evil thought could keep you out of paradise. Lucifer, the mightiest angel God ever created, had one proud thought, and God transformed him into Satan cast him out of heaven. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Change your attitudes and you can change your world. And that begins with receiving Jesus Christ into our heart to cleanse us from our guilt, to take away our fear, and to deliver us from our anger and hostility, and to put in us instead a sense of joy and peace that we might rejoice evermore. Have you received that joy and that forgiveness and that peace from God? If not, I urge you to lift up your eyes to the cross today, that God might change your heart. Are your attitudes ruining your marriage, ruining your relationship with your children, ruining your business career? Do you want to have those attitudes change? Only Christ can do that. Won't you invite him to come into your life and do that now? Or if you are a Christian and you're still struggling, look to him. Change your attitudes and you can change your world. May we pray. Father, I pray that right now that some will invite you into their lives saying, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my heart. It is filled with so many unclean things and bitter and hostile and, and awful things. Oh God, come and take them away and replace them with thoughts of peace and love and joy, which are the fruit of the Spirit. Holy Spirit of God, change my life. Cause me to rejoice evermore, for I ask it in thy holy name. Amen. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.